Welcome everyone. I'm Kim Brimmer, your host today for another edition of Bova News, keeping you up to date on the cattle industry's latest in technology, management, genetics, and more. Spring is coming soon, which means calving season will come to an end and beef producers will change their focus to getting cows rebred. There's much that goes into helping cows get through the calving season without incident and ready for the breeding season from a nutrition and reproductive standpoint. Our recent Bova News webinar focused on the nutrition aspects of getting cows ready and our conversation today focuses on getting cows ready from a reproductive standpoint. Our first presenter is Mark Johnson. Mark's a professor of animal and food sciences at Oklahoma State University, where he's worked since 1992. During his time, he's held the Tadashek Endowed Chair, served as supervisor of the OSU Purebred Beef Cattle Center, done youth and beef cattle extension programming, and coached the livestock judging team. During his coaching career, he earned the National Coach of the Year Award seven times, coached six teams that won the American Royal and four national champion teams. He teaches courses in animal breeding, cow-calf management, and purebred beef seed stock and sales. Mark has much experience in beef production and cattle evaluation and judges cattle shows across the nation. Each week, he writes an article for the Cow-Calf Corner newsletter and appears on the Cow-Calf Corner segment of OSU's Sun Up TV. Mark's a lifelong cattleman who, along with his wife, Brenda, and two daughters, Sydney and Charlie, live on a ranch near Orlando, Oklahoma, where they operate J&J Beef Genetics, LLC. J&J is a multi-breed purebred seed stock operation, including Angus and Charlay. Welcome, Mark. Good to be with you, Kim. My part of the presentation today is talking about some of those things that but we come to mind this time of year as we think about going into breeding season for spring calving herds. Uh, they're going to be turning out bulls in April and May, thinking about calving seasons next year that start in January and February. Uh, we start to think about how to improve genetics. What do we want to focus on in bull selection? And I'm going to basically walk through an exercise that I always suggest relative to just taking a look at what's going on in your own operation and the bulls that you have used that are responsible for your current set of cows and those calves that you're seeing and taking a look at that relative to potentially where you focus selection pressure as you purchase that next set of bulls or pick out that next set of AI sires going into breeding season. So we address this from a standpoint of finding balance and a lot of different things that we consider. But the first question that I think pertains and comes up this time of year, how do EPDs and dollar values apply to your particular herd goals and, and your particular operation? And this question kind of comes to bear in a time that, uh, We've seen about a fourfold increase in the amount of EPDs that most breed associations report in beef cattle. In the last 20 years, we've seen a half dozen or so dollar values come on the scene that are a normal part of our genetic prediction and the, the genetic values package, if you will, that we see presented on registration papers and then sire summaries. And with all that information out there, and it's all very useful and can pertain to your particular operation, it's tough to devote selection pressure to all those EPDs simultaneously. And the topic that we get into today is, is more about so that we don't squander selection pressure, which is a very precious commodity that we actually try to apply it where it's gonna do us the most good. So as we look through the steps, first thing that I put on here about analyzing your own production system, to help establish your breeding goals is to take a look at your current level of herd performance. I always say it's really tough to make improvement in something or to select for something if we can't quantify it with a measurement. So we want to take a look at the traits that are important to us and use those kind of as a benchmark to lead us maybe where we want to go in the future. Second thing we want to consider is the intended marketing program for our calves. In the beef industry, this is always interesting. Uh, we, we go through weather patterns. Uh, some years in Oklahoma, we grow great wheat pasture. Some years we have next to no wheat pasture, like this year. And so we might have an intended marketing program that we realize we have to be flexible with. But in the whole scheme of things, we should have an idea down the road. Are we going to be selling our calves at weaning? 
Are we going to be turning those wean calves into yearlings before we sell them? Are we potentially going to retain ownership all the way through finishing and sell fed cattle on a carcass value basis? Then the other part of that equation that comes into play, uh, the third thing that I list here, are we going to be keeping daughters out of those bulls that we're using? If that's the case and they're going to be rotational sires, then we're looking at the genetic impact of a bull we select and use this spring. It's going to be with us for 10, 12 years down the road. Uh, fourth thing, and I think that the fourth thing we kind of arrive at after we take a look at the first three is that we identify our selection goals and we decide particularly what needs to be improved and kind of connect the dots, if you will, to what EPDs are going to lead us in the direction of improving that. Uh, bull selection, sire selection is critical. Over time, about 80 to 90 percent of genetic change is a result of sire selection. And so as we work through here and think about this, one of the first things we want to address is what are the EPDs or the average set of EPDs on the bulls we have been using that are responsible for our current cow herd and the current calf crop. Um, I stress something, this is one of the big advantages that we get in modern genetic prediction. EPDs and dollar values are comparable across time and geography. And a registration paper, if we're buying registered bulls, that registration paper that we may file away the day that it comes in the mail after we purchase the bull and not really ever look at it again, it has a lot of value when we think about using it to guide a selection program. We can actually go back, find that registration number on the bulls that we've used for the past five or 10 years. And most breed registries have got an online pedigree search feature, which can be used free of charge. Got an example of one on here that's available at the Angus website. We can click on the search option. We can plug in that registration number and we can look up the current EPDs on that bull or bulls we have been using. And those are directly comparable to the bulls that we are out here selecting out of this spring. And again, it serves as a guide to us relative to the direction that we want to go. Uh, let's say, for example, that last fall, we took a look at herd performance whenever we weaned calves, uh, preg checked our cow herd, caught some weights on those mature cows, those cows in the four to seven year old age group are gonna be our best indicator of our average mature cow size. And at weaning last fall, we figured out we had an 85% pregnancy rate, an 82% calf crop weaned. The average weaning weight of those calves was 500 pounds. We do a little math, take that percent calf crop weaned in conjunction with that 500 pound weaning weight, we figure out that our cows are actually per exposed female weaning off 410 pounds of calf. And if we want to look at that as a percentage of their mature weight, those cows are weaning off 29% of their mature weight. So taking a look at that, one of the things that would come to mind for me, if I've got 1,400 pound cows, number one, regardless of what the cows weigh, I'd really like to see them weaning off a little higher percentage of their mature weight. And if I'm weaning off 410 pounds per exposed female, I'd like to drive that number up. That's actually a pretty important number to us uh, relative to profitability in commercial cow-calf operations. The higher we can make that pounds of calf wean per exposed female typically coincides with the more profitable operations. So how do we go about this? And in the scenario we're laying out here, we're going to assume that we're picking out replacement heifers at weaning. So we're going to be using bulls as rotational sires, and that is what we have been doing. So the next slide we look at, we have actually looked up five different bulls that we have used over the past five to 10 years. And collectively, and we could look at the individual EPDs on all five of those, but the thing we're interested in here are those average genetic values of those five bulls that resulted in those 1,400 pound cows, 82% of which are weaning off a calf that are weighing 500 pounds at the time we wean them. So particular numbers of relevance to us, 71 pounds of weaning weight has been our average, 128 pounds of yearling weight, 
a heifer pregnancy EPD in this column of nine, a milk EPD in this column of 20, a mature weight EPD in this column that averages 88, and a dollar B value over here that averages 151. Now, I didn't say much about the CED. Uh, we didn't have anything in this existing cow herd that indicates we're pulling too many calves or anything. So it's a 4.5 average, but we're not going to necessarily relate that to what we're going to show in the next generation here. So for example, and I just pulled a bull out of the Angus registry to compare to here, we find a new herd bull we're going to use this spring. Average or His CED is 10. It's actually got the same weaning weight of the average of these five bulls we've been using. Yearling weight's 113, so about 15 pounds less. Heifer pregnancy is a 15, so six percentage units higher than those five bulls that are responsible for siring our cow herd. Milk EPD of 20, same as the bulls we've been using. Mature weight EPD of 68, so 20 pounds less than the bulls we've been using. A dollar B value of 160. So what does that equate to as we go next generation and think about, say, five, six years down the road, that next generation of cows, when they go into production, what do we expect to see? Well, the same numbers we captured last fall, and when we fast forward a few years, we've taken 20 pounds average mature weight off our cow herd. So we're going to see about 1,380 pound cows. That 6% bump in heifer pregnancy is going to translate to about a 91% pregnancy rate, as opposed to the 85 that we saw last fall. That is going to also bump our percent calf crop weaned as we get more cows bred. We accordingly expect a higher percent calf crop weaned, so we bump that up to 88. Our average weaning weight in those calves is going to stay at 500 pounds because, we're, again, we're looking at a new bull. It's got the same weaning weight EPD. So that number itself didn't go anywhere. But what is interesting is based on better percent calf crop weaned and pregnancy rates and conception going on up here, when we do the math, we find that we're now weaning off 440 pounds of calf per exposed female. And when we look at those 1,380 pound cows that are achieving or seeing calves achieve weaning weights of 500 and 440 per exposed female. We've actually bumped up that percentage of their mature weight that they're weaning off by about 3% or up to 32. So you can work through a lot of different examples on this, but again, I stress the taking a look at your own production system part, measure what is of interest to you. It can be other things involved there. Are you pulling more calves than you feel like you should be out of your two-year-old heifers? Are you not seeing the, the level of performance you want through finishing? If you typically sell your calves then, there's a lot of layers to this onion that you want to investigate, but basically measure all the things you can, figure out what's important to you. It's going to guide you to connect the dots back to the bulls you've been using and identify some selection goals to go out and find that next set of bulls you're going to bring in as natural service or AI sires that send you in the direction for efficiency. From there, we want to shift gears a little bit and talk about ownership cost of bulls and how this might relate to leasing programs or even an AI program. And this is not an overly scientific slide, but uh, if we assume a natural service rate in yearling bulls covering about one cow per month of age that they were at the beginning of their first breeding season. We assume that a bull covers about 25 cows as a two-year-old, and he's good for about 30 to 35 cows for the rest of his life, and he lasts until he's six years of age. I arrive at a bull service as about 157 cows. If we spent $3,000 on the investment in that bull, that works out to about $19.10 per cow that he services. And as you up that price, you can see what happens. A $6,000 bull is going to cost you about $38 a cow he services. A $9,000 bull, about 57 
And a $12,000 investment in the bull costs you about $76. If we take a look at that on an annual basis on what those bulls are costing, and we're assuming one breeding season a year for the sake of these numbers, and realize that some bulls potentially get used spring and fall, but one breeding season a year and six years of service, $3,000 bull costs us about $500 a year. We keep bumping that price up. A $12,000 bull is going to cost us about $2,000 a year during his lifetime in production for us. If we think about AI sires and what some of this means, uh, if we are, say, theoretically a 100 cow operation, and we are, look, we've are we identified the bull we want to use to AI breed our cows this year. Uh, let's say we're going to pay $20 a unit for semen. Uh, typically, I assume about a 60% conception rate as we, we look at AI service. If we've got good management, herd health, good heat detection. If we bought, uh, let's just think about how much semen we would need to use. If we check heat or synchronize those cows the first time, and we AI breed 100 of them, let's say we get 60% of them bred. That means we got 60 cows covered there. We expect to see about 40 of them with a return heat in three weeks. If we get a 60% conception rate on those, after two AI cycles, we're probably ready to turn out a herd bull. Theoretically, we ought to have about 84 cows covered after two AI breedings uh, over 21 days or two different heat cycles. And so, Eventually, we turn out a bull figuring he's got 15, 20 cows to breed. And again, if we do the math on that, we're going to need about 140 units of semen. So we've invested at $20 a unit, we've got about 2,800 in semen that we would have needed to have bred those cows. And I am not accounting for what kind of synchronization method or the time we spent. Uh, just heat checking and watching those cows as we bring them in. And I think those kind of decisions are ones that, again, each breeder or individual operation is going to have to take a look at the economics of it in their own operation. We know we can use elite AI service genetics. Uh, we're going to have to factor and balance that cost relative to what we'd be investing in herd bulls to turn them out. Obviously, if we're going to devote time to artificial insemination, it should decrease the amount of natural service sires that we need out there to cover behind them. So just things to consider working through the math in terms of ownership cost of bulls, leasing bulls, or the investment in genetics through AI. Um, final thoughts on my topic today. Um, each bull that you consider using should be evaluated relative to your own unique operation and the genetic values that he offers that can potentially improve your bottom line. Uh, buying bulls, using bulls through AI should be looked at as an investment in genetics. And if we can identify the right genetics relative to our operation, it adds profit potential long-term. And genetic change is a cumulative and permanent thing. So identifying the right bulls for your operation is a very important thing to do and something that comes to mind this time of year. I appreciate you joining us. That brings my part of the program to closure. Thank you, Mark. Our next presenter is Dr. Jordan Thomas. Jordan is an assistant professor and state beef reproduction specialist in the Division of Animal Sciences at the University of Missouri. He's a Missouri native and University of Missouri alumnus, having earned his PhD in animal sciences with an emphasis in reproductive physiology in 2017. Jordan maintains an active applied research program in reproductive management of beef cattle. He coordinates a breeding program for cattle across the University of Missouri Agricultural Experiment Station Research Center herds and serves as a program advisor to the Show Me Select Replacement Heifer Program. The primary research focus of his lab is the control of the bovine estrus cycle specifically to facilitate use of reproductive technologies such as timed artificial insemination and embryo transfer. Welcome, Jordan. Well, thanks for having me. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the synchronization side of things, and this is going to have a very commercial focus, um, but the bottom line is just why would you even consider using estrus synchronization? And I often start just by talking about costs. You know, many of our costs of production are out of control on the commercial cow-calf side of things. And so it can be a little bit difficult to argue to any commercial 
commercial producer that uh, that they should spend more on any cost of production. And certainly breeding is, is one expense um, that I think can be tempting to cut. And I want to try to make a case today that often what we are really trying to do is control things that cause costs rather than just cutting individual costs and actually poorly manage reproduction, or you might even say just under manage reproduction not only leaves revenue opportunities on the table, but it causes a lot of other costs. And so I want to start here. If you think about the top half of the screen as one example cow and the bottom half of the screen as another example cow, you know, if we think about a 60 day breeding season, which in many cases is what folks are maybe aspiring towards, we know we have often much longer breeding seasons than that, much longer calving seasons than that in, in real world operations. But let's say a 60 day calving season is maybe a, a goal and what has been achieved in this situation. If you think about the cow that conceives and, 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 and becomes pregnant on the first day of that relatively short breeding season of 60 days, and then calves roughly on the first day of the calving season, um, there's a period of time after calving in which she is not having normal estrus cycles. We call it postpartum anestrus. And that is controlled at the level of the brain, essentially, and influenced by all sorts of factors. You know, how much body conditions um, does she have in terms of energy reserves? Um, what is the energy availability in her uh, environment nutritionally? Um, does she have a cap inside? What's her lactational output? Um, all of those factors really influence how long that length of postpartum and estrus is. But at some point, she's going to resume having normal estrus cycles. And ideally, if some of those management pieces are, are going in the right direction, we've got her cycling prior to the start of that next breeding season. But consider then, and again, this is often a goal to have a, a breeding season of, of 60 days and a calving season of 60 days, but just consider the animal that conceives on the last day of that relatively short breeding season of 60 days and calves roughly on the last day of that calving season of 60 days. Well, there's a period of time now after calving in which she also is not having normal estrus cycles. But if you do the math, that now starts to interfere with when the next breeding season really needs to start. And we're tied to the forage base, right? We're tied to something, uh, you know, something about our system is trying to calve at this time of year. And I have it shown here as if it's a mid-January to mid-March calving system. And I'm not saying to do that, but just as an example, let's say that's the system we're trying to do that for some kind of a reason. And, and we're trying to keep our cost of production in line by calving at, in some way relative to available forage in most cases. So we really need that breeding season to occur at the exact same time in the next year. And if she's not cycling at the start of that next breeding season, there are a couple implications. One is she's not just going to magically become an early conceiving and early calving cow. Now, you might get a rare cow that actually does do that. But on the average, if you think about these two, you know, livestock in the way that we ought to use that word as if they're live stock, two words, an investment that just happens to be alive. Um, if you think about them as investments, as an investment class, this later conceiving and later calving cow is is really unlikely to be an early conceiving and early calving cow next year. And she's actually much more likely to be open because, for example, she may only get one opportunity to become pregnant in that next breeding season. And based on everything that we know now about embryonic loss in cattle, if we give just one opportunity to an animal to become pregnant, we should expect to have a fairly high percentage of them open. So the question I always ask is, just from a business perspective, which of these livestock drives up the annual cost associated with cow replacement, or, or what I like to refer to as cow depreciation, which cow is driving that cost of production higher? It's really that later conceiving cow. And here's an example of that if we look in the, in the published literature of just the percentage of cows falling out of the herd as a function of when they calved uh, last year. So what is the percentage of cows that failed to have a calf next year as a result of when they calved this year? And as you can see, if those cows calved in roughly the first 20 days of the calving season, only a, a fairly low percentage of them fail to breed back, if you will, next year. And that inches up a little bit as they calve in the next 20 days. And it inches up even more if they're calving in that last 20 days and, and so on and so forth. We see this stair-step relationship. Long calving seasons kind of require long breeding seasons and those lead to long calving seasons. It's really a vicious 
cycle. And I always try to point out on this slide that this is a 1958 paper. Uh, we have known about this stuff for a long time, but we often haven't allowed it to influence our management decisions. And, and that's what I'm trying to drive at today. One of those things that it really ought to influence is our heifer selection decisions. And this is a paper out of the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center and also commercial herds in South Dakota. And they looked at the percentage of heifers that remained in a herd over successive calving seasons. So essentially the longevity or stability of those females as a function of just when they had their very first calf, their very first year. So that black line with the diamonds, that's those heifers that conceived and had their first calf in the first 21 days of their first calving season. And those heifers in the represented by the dash line with the squares, those are those heifers that conceived and had their first calf in either the next estrous cycle or the next estrous cycle. And so what we see happen, A, is a disappointing data set, and I always try to acknowledge that. This is a fairly disappointing breed back in either of these uh, two sets of two-year-olds, right? We certainly want to have much higher breed back performance in first calf heifers. This is just the real-world commercial data out of that particular paper. But what you see happen is that those later conceiving heifers that were later calving heifers in their first year, we really struggle to get them bred back as two-year-old cows with their first calf at side. And so we have fewer of them make it into production, or continue on in production. And I think we know that. I think we know that later conceiving heifers and later calving heifers are, are hard to get to breed back as two-year-olds. But do we realize that, that that same thing happens in three-year-old cows really for the same reason? Those cows are still behind and still struggling to breed back and remain in the herd. And if you do the math on this, in this paper, it's about 1.2 years of productivity that is given up in the later conceiving heifers uh, that calve as obviously later calving cows in their first year in production. So early conceiving heifers is really a major opportunity emphasizing management practices that, that generate more early conceiving heifers, and then also being pretty strict about which bred heifers we actually choose to invest in uh, and allow to enter the herd as cows. Ideally, we want to really only hire on, so to speak, the heifers that conceived early and will calve early in their first year in production. Now, Consider that same uh, hypothetical of those two widely different cows, and let's now talk about the revenue side of the equation. Which of these cows brings in the most revenue? Not only weaning a heavier calf, but also weaning more total calves over her lifetime because of that greater longevity in the herd. Well, again, those heifers in that data set that we just looked at, they stay in the herd about 1.2 years longer on average if they're early conceiving heifers, so that's 1.2 more physical calves but they also have higher weaning weights in that first year in production, which should make sense, right? They conceived and calved earlier, therefore they have an older calf in that first year in production uh, when that calf is brought to the weaning pen, so to speak. But do we also realize that they have a heavier calf their second year in production and their third year and their fourth year and their fifth year and their sixth year in that particular data set? So a lot of advantages Aside from the genetic piece of weaning weight, which is obviously important as well, there's a management component to weaning weight because those calves from birth to weaning will often gain about two pounds a day. And so a 20-day difference in calf age could easily be around 40 pounds of weaning weight. So if we talk about a 60-day long breeding season, we might easily expect to see 100 plus pound differences between calves that are born in the very early portion of the calving season and those that are born late. So a major opportunity um, to really improve overall performance with what we do in terms of reproductive management. Now, synchronization is really just a tool and it's a tool in the toolbox. Obviously, pregnancy diagnosis is probably the most important reproductive technology that we have because we, we need to identify when cows became pregnant and when heifers became pregnant. And if, if you've heard me speak on some of those topics before, you know I'm an advocate for trying to essentially cull animals a year ahead of time and strategically divest out of certain animals that just haven't become pregnant early enough in the breeding season. But synchronization is a tool to begin managing that a little bit more proactively because now we can actually skew the proportion of cows that conceive early in the breeding season and therefore become these early conceiving females. So in the right system, you know, if you package those pieces of management together, we're going to do pregnancy diagnosis, we're going to do some wise business decisions 
in how we market cows and, and how we select heifers. Well, if we package synchronization up with that, now we can really increase the total value of calves weaned across the farmer ranch. We can really decrease costs associated with cow depreciation. I often talk about that as being the, the second biggest cost of production embedded into every calf, really second only to feed related inputs. And then we also have an opportunity to be more efficient with our use of some other things that cost, right? So labor being one of those, you know, now with a, with a little bit of labor investment for synchronization AI, we can often dramatically decrease labor related uh, needs um, to calving, especially in terms of how long the calving season drags out. Another one to think about is, you know, what is the feed related cost of kind of undermanaged reproduction reproduction in cow calf herds? The example I like to use is, um, it, let's say you have a September calving fall type of herd, and, and that hasn't been all that well managed. And so we have some September calves, but we also have some December calves. Well, you know, in January and February, which female are you supplementing? Because we have females that are actually at pretty different stages of production, have pretty different needs. And often we get really inefficient with our use of feed resources because we're either managing to the lowest common denominator and, and maybe over supplementing some cows and under supplementing other cows. And uh, we can be way more efficient and have way better management systems, even in terms of our feed inputs, when we manage some of this variation among the females with reproductive management. Just to talk through a little bit more of this calving season, um, you know, calving distribution, when are calves born during the calving season and why this matters so much. This is from an extension publication that um, that I put together just on management considerations for the calving season, but it compares two hypothetical situations. And, and I like this example because I often hear a total pregnancy rate told to me as if I can sort of uh, um, give some commendations that that was a good pregnancy rate. And, and we really don't know what a good pregnancy rate is if we don't know that something about time, you know, a, a good pregnancy rate of 90 plus percent isn't all that meaningful to me if that was a hundred plus day long breeding season, right? Um, so what we really care about is what percentage of the calves were conceived or, or will be born by what day of the calving season. So there's two examples in here. One is a long, more typical kind of breeding program that results in a long, more typical kind of calving system. In this case, it's 84 days long. Uh, and one is a fixed time AI system with two rounds of natural service. So essentially a bull is exposed then for two estrous cycles to complete estrous cycles following fixed time AI, about a 42, 45 day breeding type of program. And, and it's set up to compare the same pregnancy rate. So it's a 90% total pregnancy rate in either case, but you can see the difference in terms of when calves were actually uh, born. And I'll refer you to the publication if you want to look at it in more detail. But essentially, the, the takeaway is we wean about 10% more pounds of calf um, in, in these front-loaded systems, and at least in this particular comparison, if you make some conservative assumptions about weaning weight and, and pre-weaning gain of calves. And, and I think that's is a big deal, right? If you think about any other business, what other business can afford to leave 10% production just untapped? Uh, I don't think we can. It's also important to realize that we're making a one-year decision to use ester synchronization and AI, but it has a payout period of really multiple years, especially if we stick with that. Uh, and, and really, we need to stick with that in order to see some of the major improvements. So choose a protocol you can cash flow, um, you know, do something that makes sense. Often that's going to be a protocol that involves a progestin, especially if we have a longer uh, calving season already. We really want to be looking at that as a tool. Um, but it is a long-term investment and make that, make that progress with a long-term goal in mind. To show you just an example of that, this is the percentage of calves born over a certain day of the calving season at the University of Missouri Thompson Research Center in Spickard, Missouri. And it shows multi-year progress through the use of reproductive technologies. So if you look at the red line, those are um, a period of three years in which only natural service was used with no synchronization. And then the blue lines represent five years that followed in which synchronization and heat detection and AI were used um, in the early portion of the breeding season, followed by natural service. And then the pink line is those years in which fixed time artificial insemination was performed to start the breeding season. 
and then natural service bulls were exposed for the remainder of the breeding season. And what you see happen is, well, if you look towards day 45 or 46 out here at the far end of the, of the figure, um, well, we achieve a pretty similar overall pregnancy rate, right? But look at how those lines shift to the left in the early portion of the calving season. We have more total calves born by every given day of the calving season in those uh, front-loaded systems. And if you think about it, the area between those lines is additional pounds of calf or additional days postpartum for those cows next year as we set them up to have uh, essentially higher reproductive potential in the following season. You can see some of those implications in the, the, the uh, the table on the right, which is actually some data out of the University of Florida's North Research uh, uh, and Education Center in the Panhandle, a little town called Mariana. And they looked at implementing use of synchronization AI over a six year period. And so the, the blue columns are those years in which no synchronization was used just to generate a baseline. And then they begin imposing some synchronization and AI and better reproductive management in general. Uh, here in 2008. And what you see is the average day on which the calves are born in the calving season drops. And that is associated with an increase in per calf value. That's obviously favorable, $87 in this case, and those dollars, I believe it's all $2015 for the sake of the analysis. But if you look at 2009, well, now we add a little bit of additional calf value because we get more of those calves born early. And then in 2010, even still a bit of additional calf value. And if you, if, you, if you track this through, I call this a snowball effect, right? It's building up a little bit every year. And if you look six years down the road, we've added $169 in per calf value to that herd just through imposing some better reproductive management. So that's a major opportunity. Just to get you excited about some of the opportunities that are out there, um, we, we have a protocol that um, we've worked on a lot at the University of Missouri called 7 and 7 Sync. It's a protocol for postpartum beef cows, a very effective, uh, really got to give some credit to my graduate students that did a lot of the work to figure, uh, to figure out how this would actually work in the field. And a lot of good work that has been done over the years in related areas to understand some of the physiology behind this concept. But it involves administering prostaglandin at seed or insertion essentially a week ahead of when a standard or more typically used protocol would start. Uh, so it's three trips through the chute and then a timed AI. Um, a little bit of additional handling, I realize that, but just to give you an idea of what that can generate, uh, in this particular data set, we had, first of all, strong pregnancy rates to AI in either case. If you look at conventional semen on the seven-day co-sync cedar, it's 61%. That's a great pregnancy rate to a fixed time AI. Right. And then 72% with the seven and seven sync protocol, also just a, a really exceptional pregnancy rate. Sometimes we look at those and, and we feel like they're not close to 100. Right. So we don't get all that excited about that. Think about that. That's that's 60 to 70 some percent of those cows conceiving on the very first day of the breeding season and being set up to calve, you know, roughly on the very first day of the calving season. That is absolutely huge for the productivity of a commercial cow-calf enterprise uh, for all the reasons we've already talked about. That is a really, really big deal. And this is biologically possible. You know, you package this up with some good management. It takes more than just a synchronization protocol to get those kind of results, but this is certainly a possibility and, and well within um, the range of what we you know, continue to see with this protocol and, and with good reproductive management. Now, I don't have time to cover um, all sorts of things today that we really ought to cover if we're interested in getting cows um, bred to artificial insemination or getting cows bred just even to, to good reproductive management programs in general, whether that be using artificial insemination or natural service. But I'll refer you to this publication. This is a whole system management of beef cattle reproduction. It's 30 some publications out of the University of Missouri. It's a pretty complete guide uh, to managing reproduction. And it has some of these um, ideas that I've just hinted at today, like maybe selection and replacement heifers uh, with more of a commercial uh, profitability mentality um, or cow-calf systems that minimize cow depreciation costs. That's one of those in there as well. I just refer you to that if you have some interest. Um, some of those publications include protocol guides. Um, and I, I know many of you that maybe have not used AI, you might be overwhelmed when you see a um, synchronization type of treatment schedule sheet in the back of an AI catalog or something like that. These resources are also out there for you. They just walk you through these in a little bit um, uh, 
just with a little more handholding, I think is, is maybe the way that I would say it. There's just more information here on helping you select a protocol that maybe makes some sense and letting you see some of the AI strategies that are possible within some of these protocols so that you can really pick out one that works for you. There's one for cows, there's one for heifers. There are different considerations there just based on the maturity and the challenges that we face in either of those two classes of cattle. And then there's one for use of natural service pools. You know, I'm a big proponent of the use of AI, but I also realize that a lot of our commercial operations are already pretty heavily invested in a natural service pool battery. And, and maybe for a year or two, we need to cash flow some better reproductive management um, by using some synchronization with natural service. This is a great way to get started um, managing reproduction at a little bit higher level. And some of these protocols are very simple. Um, something like a one-shot prostaglandin protocol. We turn in bulls on day one. Four or five days later, we go give all the cows prostaglandin, and that's all there is to that protocol. I mean, talk about simple and also talk about effective. It's a very effective protocol to begin making some progress on some of the things that we've talked about, getting more cows bred early in the breeding season. If you have some interest in sex-sorted semen, uh, there's a guide on that as well. I'm not going to go into that today, but we do have some ever-improving strategies to use sex-sorted semen in, in AI programs. And just lastly, I would refer you to my YouTube channel and um, also have a Facebook page on which some of those videos are posted as well and try to share articles and things like that on there. That's Mizzou Repro on YouTube and, and on Facebook. Uh, and, and for example, let's say you've never put in cedars. Um, you could watch this two minute video on, on how to do that and, and feel very comfortable with it. Or if you're interested in portable breeding barns or you're interested in reproductive track scores, um, you know, we, we have those videos on there as well. And also some talks that, that might be helpful to you, uh, bull management or maybe managing cows as they transition to spring forage and trying to keep those cows in you know, positive energy balance. There's some, some good talks on there as well. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions and, and just appreciate the chance to visit with you today. Thank you, Jordan. Now I have a few questions for the two of you. Uh, what are some procedures that producers can do to handle an estrus cows? And when do you make that decision to keep or cull? Yeah, so let's start with maybe the keeper coal piece of that. Um, from a business perspective and a commercial operation, I often talk about um, culling cows a year ahead of time, which what I mean by that is every cow we could kind of do a profit and loss projection on. We don't necessarily think about our investments in that way, um, but but I, I, I like to do that to undergrads, make them do a, a profit and loss calculation for cows almost based entirely on their reproductive um, you know, outcomes. So set a pregnancy diagnosis results. Let's do a profit and loss projection on what those cows actually stand to do. It's pretty hard to get late conceiving, late calving cows to really be profitable as commercial investments. And yet they're often a bit overvalued in the market because they're carrying a pregnancy. And so knowing that those females, we have an opportunity to actually divest out of them and redeploy that equity into a early conceiving female, whether that's a bred cow, whether that's a replacement heifer, some other kind of opportunity is often a very wise move. Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, think about trying to cull cows um, after they've had their calf or something like that, but unless we really have a strong opportunity to market pairs. So, th so thinking through maybe opportunities to more proactively market females rather than um, working ourselves into a corner and having cold females that are problematic is how I typically go about that. Now, the other piece of that puzzle is we have really good reproductive management tools to, to make progress from the other side of the equation, which is get later conceiving, later calving cows may be moved up. Um, and that's when we talk about an estrus, we're, we're talking about later calving cows often, but we're also talking about thin cows. We're also talking about maybe some age-related challenges like our two-year-old females that have longer um, lengths of postpartum anestrus anyway. Cedars are really a big opportunity uh, for those anestrus cows. The cedar product is a progesterone-releasing in, uh, intravaginal device. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a spendy product. It's one of our more expensive estrus synchronization products, but it also has some really good return on investment potential because we can move cattle up. We can get cyclicity initiated with the cedar. So that is uh, typically what I think about. GNRH is a little bit effective for that as well, but the cedar products and the protocols that involve cedars are really a great opportunity for anestrus cows. Likewise, you know, we have some things we can do nutritionally. Uh, we we got to keep plant of nutrition high during the breeding season, going into the breeding season, and that's a big piece of how we manage that problem as well. 
What adjustments need to be made if producers are using sex semen? Mark? Adjustments, uh, we would think probably AIing those cows a little bit later. Uh, there's some additional costs we're going to have to budget in when we think about purchasing that semen typically. Uh, upside to it is if we're breeding heifers uh, and we wanted to use sexed heifer semen, we know we're going to generate a calf that's going to weigh on average about six to eight pounds less than a bull calf would. So we can actually factor in a little bit of additional calving ease if we go that route. Uh, those would be the three things that would come to mind for me. Jordan, anything else to add? Yeah, so sex semen is a little bit of a different beast um, in, in terms of AI programs. We know it's more sensitive to the time of um, in, insemination relative to ovulation. We typically want to be a little bit closer to ovulation, just like I uh, mentioned. And so it's not necessarily that we want to use a later fixed time AI time, but if we were performing heat detection in AI, we would want to be a little bit later after onset of heat. Now, if we're performing a, a fixed time AI protocol, we really want to use a protocol that has some data behind it, supporting the use of that protocol with sex semen, because some protocols control the estrus expression and ovulatory time more precisely. And we really want to have that in, in use of uh, sex semen. We really want to have a protocol that makes some sense and has some data behind it. Uh, the other piece of that puzzle is sex sorted semen is really um, sensitive to the estrus expression status of females at the time of the timed AI. So often we see commercial producers and in seed stock producers really regardless, maybe only using sex semen in those females that have an activated estrus detection aid at the time of a fixed time AI. If you are using the fixed time AI, that's just a pretty wise cost conscious strategy. And then using conventional semen in those females that don't. And what about housing, the housing and facilities considerations that producers really need to have in place to make handling the cows for AI easier? Jordan? Yeah, I can, I can chime in on that one. Um, you know, I, I often see probably don't really need to have anything extremely, you know, uh, fancy to carry out an AI program, but there are um, some minimum requirements, we, we're probably going to need to have a, a chute to be able to restrain those animals, right? And we probably need to have a set of pens that we can work animals through fairly efficiently. Other than that, uh, you know, there are things that speed up the process and make it maybe easier on labor. Uh, but often facilities is not really a major barrier if we already have a somewhat acceptable set of facilities to work out of. If you really feel like your facilities aren't up to par, um, you know, I would honestly consider um, finding some facilities that you can lease, whether that's a, a set of portable corral panels or uh, you know a, a port portable corral system, uh, maybe a portable breeding barn, depending on where you're trying to conduct some of those AI programs. Um, even though it might seem like an out you know an outlay of cash to rent those facilities to get a program like that done, you just think about the return on investment potential associated with these programs, and, and there's a lot of it. Um, I, I would really encourage you to make that investment, even if you feel like your facilities aren't quite up to par. As we wrap up today, uh, if you're using AI, how many services should producers go through before resorting to the herd bull? Mark? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I typically, as a rule of thumb, will work off 60% conception rate with AI. Sometimes it may be much higher than that. Sometimes it may not be that good. But if we think about that, the theoretical 100 cow operation, one AI service, we should get 60 cows bred. Three weeks later, another round of heat detection, we should get about another 24 bred. Those 40 that we see return heats on leaves us about 16 cows. We could continue through it for another 21 day heat detection cycle if we'd like. Uh, and keep doing that math. My general rule of thumb is we give cows a couple AI opportunities and turn out bulls. Well, thank you so much to the two of you today for sharing your invaluable expertise and experience. Don't forget to subscribe to the Bova News channel on YouTube. Find our Bova News podcast on your favorite listening platform or find more information at bovanews.com. Thanks for tuning in with us today, and we'll see you next time on another edition of Bova News. Mm -hmm.